Good afternoon. Um, my name is Shannon Robinson again, and I'm from Aspire Health Partners, and I'm very excited to talk about some of the hospital diversion programs that we are putting into place to kind of bridge the gap. Um, Aspire actually has a hospital diversion plan that's been operating. It started off in 2015 as a hospital pilot with two of the community hospitals and quickly spread out throughout the community. Um, to date, we've actually received about 2,600 referrals. From that 2,600 referrals, we've been able to place about 2,000 of those individuals in Aspire's continuum of care. And essentially, this platform reaches out, connects our organization and our continuum of care directly into the EDs as well as the medical units um, to bring individuals in need of services directly into whatever level of service that is. And we operate that with nurses as well as case managers. And we connect the care on the units with those case managers to get them into services. So today we have with us is Claudia Vincenzo and Alberto um, from Memorial Hospital, also PJ Brooks from First Steps in Sarasota, and Patricia Ellingham from DACO to talk a little bit about their hospital diversion programs and um, see how they're working things. Okay. We'll start off with our eight minute uh, TED style. So, um, good morning. My colleague, Alberto Augustin, and I are going to be presenting in seven to eight minutes on the continuum of care that we've um, been very fortunate to help develop for our hospital system. And we are lucky because we're able to house so many services under one roof. Um, but I would say to you that who are working in the community that the, um, as John Bryant noted, in the emergency department, in the, the physicians, people in medical settings have been at the front lines of this opioid epidemic for years without the ability to link people with resources and care. So now we are providing this and our systems are, I'm sure that hospital systems are eager to link with providers such as yourself. So we, we decided to break up our component into four acts. And first act, we've got a problem. Uh, we know we have a serious issue uh, nationally with opioid-related deaths. Um, we know that there's been a significant rise in 2016. We know that 2017 is going to be also very uh, alarming. We know that in the state we have a serious problem. We know in our county, we, we're in Broward County, we have a serious problem. So we wanted to see what was going on in our health system. Our health system is the fourth largest public health system in the United States. And when we looked at our system, uh, anything related to opioid-related events, we had about 4,000 encounters in 2016. And with that, we had approximately $3.5 million worth of expenditures related to these events. So obviously, we know we have a huge ability to have an impact in our particular community. So what were we going to do about it? Um, we've developed three programs, starting with uh, about three years ago, the Mothers in Recovery Program, which focused on treating opioid addiction and pregnancy. So treating pregnant women with opioid use disorders with the goal of reducing the incidence of neonatal abstinence syndrome and improving the rates of pregnant women who were in treatment. And with, with that being said, our program is going on our three-year anniversary. We've treated over, over 90 moms. Uh, of those moms, there's many still in the program. About approximately 80 or so have given birth, and the success rate is approximately 92% of those moms have given birth to babies that are drug-free, which is quite impressive. And, when you, and, and just to give you an idea, the difference of a baby exposed versus unexposed typically relates to uh, needing a NICU day. And the average length of stay in the NICUs has increased from approximately 10 days to now 21, and we're looking at 30-day NICU days. So the savings of that alone to just Medicaid is about $5.8 million that we've saved over the course of 2016 alone. So it just gives you an impact of the Mothers in Recovery program. So when STR funding uh, was available in June of this past year, we were, uh, had already been working with uh, using Subutex or buprenorphine on its own with pregnant women. So we were um, ready to take action and spread our program to the general population and just start targeting uh, medication assisted treatment with um, everybody that we can work with, men and women obviously, um, and to reduce the, no reduce the incidence of opioid related deaths and increase the number of people that were engaged effectively in medication assisted treatment. 
Yeah, so just like Walter mentioned, our, what we're seeing in outcomes related to patients that are on MAT are exactly what saying, that the differences in employment, the differences in uh, socioeconomic related events. Um, but, de but definitely the impact that we've had to be able to implement MAT uh, because of MER was uh, monumental. And one of the stories I like to tell is that the, the shift in culture, we're talking about that, how can we shift this culture is very important. One of the first discussions I had when we started MAT was, uh, was with one of our physicians and the question was, he says, so now we're accepting men? And at, at that point in time, I said, yes, doc, we're, we're now accepting men and you know, it's equal opportunity, which goes along with some of the stats I saw that they presented about the percentage of men versus women in treatment. So it's very interesting that initially we started with MER, obviously all female, and now we've come open and, and we have uh, all aspects of care. Um, and just to be clear, we uh, use Narcan, we use Subutex, we use Suboxone, um, and then we use Naltrexone, both oral and then the Vivitrol, the injectable form. So that, that goes throughout all of our programs. Um, what we're working on now is an emergency department pilot program, which is working with peer specialists in the emergency department, screening as many people as we can, as Aspire does, to try to get them enrolled in our program, um, giving them Narcan kits, engaging them in um, letting them know that we care about them um, getting better, getting into treatment, and starting to have their lives um, improve. To touch upon the, the complications related to uh, implementing something in, a, in an emergency setting, uh, Dr. Stavros was talking about his ED and how busy they are. Uh, I want to emulate that in the setting. Our ED sees approximately 350 patients per day. It's extremely busy. And just like he was saying, you walk down through our ED and with the flu epidemic going on, um, where you have uh, blue alerts being called, stroke alerts being called. So to, uh, to engage the ED physician to say, hey, this is an opportunity to, to get a patient into a program that works was a huge culture shift. And it's something that we, we now have the buy-in from our physicians, our medical director, and the staff. And it's that shift that's allowed us to continue into this program. And like we said, um, they're eager to partner with us. Um, Dr. Tucker, um, Dr. Oxen, and myself started out the, this new year on January 2nd at like 7 o'clock in the morning in a uh, physician emergency department physician staffing meeting. The medical director of our emergency department at Memorial Regional had asked us to present with two of our um, patients currently in medication assisted treatment. They wanted to hear the patient stories of how the care that they were providing was impacting people's lives because in the emergency department you see somebody for a brief period of time you may not see them again until they return but to see what you what what you've done as an emergency department physician, how much impact you've had. And um, I mean, the, the doctors were totally engaged. The patients were so happy to talk to them about how this program has helped them. So in terms of design, the services that we provide include, we do inductions in the emergency department. We have um, peer recovery support. We do intensive outpatient um, and day treatment. We have um, individual therapy. We use dialectical behavior therapy and then trauma-targeted treatment. Um, we have medical services working with a psychiatrist, clinical pharmacy specialists, and nurses that are working with um, you know, ongoing assessment using clinical withdrawal scale. Did I miss anything? I think you got it off. <laughs> Tammy, did I miss anything? Um, so the four tenets that run across our programs and everything that we do are number one, engagement. Two is rapid access to treatment. Four is multidisciplinary approach to treatment and then collaboration with community partners. In terms of engagement, it's getting people at multiple access points. So where are they coming in? If they're on a medical unit for complications related to IV drug use, then we want to start talking to them at that point. If they're in the emergency department, if they're coming to our outpatient behavioral health center, that's where we start to engage them in treatment. Now, I'll piggyback on that. Uh, a large subset of our patients were engaged on the medical floor, were there for an osteomyelitis, endocarditis for six weeks. And while they're getting IV antibiotics, is an opportunity for our team to engage them and say, you know what, we can actually initiate MAT on the floor while you're receiving this antibiotic and then you continue into our program. So great opportunity for those who are interested. Rapid access is key, like she mentioned, for us. Uh, we have 24-7 uh, access to our ED, and because everybody's on board, the process is the same, whether they're going to be discharged, whether they're going to be admitted to the floor for a complication, rapid access is, is very important for our program. 
Multidisciplinary is also a, a huge tenant. If you can imagine what we experienced and what we learned through our mothers in recovery is that 100% of the patients that we've treated, 100% had a co-occurring disorder, 100%. And we're seeing the same thing in this MET subset, 100%, with a large subset having polysubstance. So we're not just dealing with opioids, we're dealing with opioids with benzos, with cocaine. They're, they're using it, one's going for the upper, the downer, and then, and then they're mixing it. So if you can't address all those needs, it's gonna be very difficult to have success. And then finally, as well, is that we have infectious disease processes. So a lot of them have hep C, some of them have HIV. So how do you address those issues? And then obviously, socioeconomic. If you can't address socioeconomic, you're going to run into some trouble in, in, in many of these patients. Um, what we found is that the length of time that it takes for individuals in our medication system treatment program to begin to stabilize is much longer than what we were seeing before when we were just doing intensive outpatient services for people with substance use disorders. The patient population that we're working with, they're dealing with um, compounded trauma over years. They're dealing with um, transportation needs, housing needs. There's so many different things going on that really looking to treatment that is responsive to their needs and being able to adjust our approach so that we're really supporting their efforts to stay engaged in treatment. And that I think that's a piece somebody had asked about, um, you know, having them on medication for the rest of their lives. We're working with our peer specialists and doing um, recovery support services so they, that there's that light at the end of the tunnel and that they're looking at what am I going to do as how do I start getting a job, how do I... Um, you know, how do I repair the relationships that I have with my family? So these are things that the fourth piece, which is collaboration with the community, has been key in doing. So working with folk rehab, working with drug court, child welfare, um, sober homes, these are things that have really made our program work um, and meet the multiple needs of our, uh, the clients that we serve. So that, I think that wraps up our eight minutes, or maybe more. But, uh, but finally, we, we obviously don't have enough time to talk about all the tenants, everything we want to talk about. We will leave you with this. There are many barriers we've, we've faced, many barriers we've overcome, and many barriers we still see on the horizon that we have to deal with. So just uh, letting you know uh, some things that we've de dealt with in our program. Thank you very much, guys. Oh, I'm next, so now you get the dumb version, okay. Um, Actually, what they said, the small part about being in the hospital, that's us. <laughs> no, um, actually, um, the um, effort that we started actually started with Sarasota Memorial Hospital um, as a response to a crisis related to the number of um, individuals coming in, IV drug users with blood-borne infections, ending up needing heart valve replacements, going on IV antibiotics, um, staying in the hospital for six to eight weeks, still actively drug-seeking, okay? and um, wreaking havoc in the hospital. And one of the biggest issues, as much as anything, we can talk about the cost savings and the issues are related to that, because 50% recidivate, okay? Um, that um, it was a morale challenge within the hospital staff. The medical staff, especially the nursing staff, were just overwhelmed. They felt um, inadequate and totally unprepared, uneducated. And they also were bringing to table a lot of their own biases that were um, uh, negatively impacting their desire to work with the patient population. This was, a, this was a patient population that they, in many respects, wanted out of the hospital. They did not want to see in there. Um, and, and because of that, the, the intent that where this came about was um, one nurse, Dana Gow, who uh, kind of was the spearhead, um, kind of went around some things and went to the board of directors for the hospital and said, hey, we need to really look at this. Um, they had a whole, they had a, actually a whole unit, um, seven courtyard, where they were, the entire floor was filled with these individuals, IV drug users with endocarditis. Um, and, um, and she was able to get some movement um, to take a look at what could be done. And so as their um, bioethics committee started to look at issues, they, they realized that they weren't equipped within, internally to be able to adequately deal with it and reached out to um, community partners, specifically our organization, First Step, and Operation PAR, um, who is our uh, community's mental, uh, methadone provider, to uh, help them identify and, and create a way of uh, addressing this. Um, what we were able to put into play through support from Central Florida Behavioral Health Network uh, with funding was we were able to uh, co-locate a clinician within the hospital. Uh, we had to go through the whole uh, privileging process, which, my God, 
Um, I thought getting your license was a challenge. Um, uh, it was a very interesting process, but we did have to go through that. We had to have a, a medical sponsor within the hospital, a doctor who would sponsor the, the clinical staff, and actually Stephanie Diaz is here. She's our, our person um, uh, that's embedded in the hospital. Um, and uh, she's actually here with her, with uh, Sir Sir Memorial counterpart, uh, Lila Roulette, who um, actually worked for me previously, which is kind of cool. I, I like this, you know, it all comes around. I've been at this 29 years, so it's, I've been around a lot of people. Um, but um, the, um, the idea was that um, we realized that the medical staff had so little training. They had, I mean, on average, a you know, medical professional gets about two hours of training in addictions uh, during their medical residency. So they, had, they didn't know what they were looking at. Plus they have what, I would, what is called the writing reflex. They want the patients to mind, okay? And um, the World Health Organization recognizes that 50% of poor health outcomes are directly attributable to the patient not minding, okay? Um, and so, you know, they, they just weren't equipped to, to understand what they were looking at. And, and, and unfortunately, we are still stigmatized with the moral measure of this, with this client population rather than the medical uh, chronic disease model. Um, and so, um, included in, in, in the uh, placement of the clinician within the hospital, uh, we, uh, prior to that, did extensive staff training on addictive disorders and really went into detail to provide uh, essentially addiction 101 throughout the hospital and, and continue doing it on a regular basis, um, uh, recognizing that the, the staff just don't know what they're looking at. But they, you know, one of the things that happens is, is with, with the training, we're able to really help them recognize that every one of us are affected by this. Even if you're not dealing with it personally yourself, most of everybody coming to the table has someone that they can identify that is in the throes of the disease of addiction in some capacity. And that often colors their view and helping them to recognize, to look at that and to pull that out of, you know, you know to really step back from, from that when they're looking at the patient population. Some other things that have also were, that were put into place because our clinician acts as a consult and is called in to work with the patient population. She goes into the hospital and is given a list of patients that she needs to see. And again, we're using the, 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 the stages of change as our way of describing to the, the medical staff on how ready the patients are. And you know, there are times when Stephanie will go in and get an FU, get out of my, get out of my, you know, my, my room. And uh, pretty contemplative, you know, I think we can pretty much say that. Um, and, um, you know, and we go through that. And also um, setting up rules and boundaries because in many respects, we were, we were, they were on an ongoing basis and still wrestle with this with, um, you know, visitors bringing in, uh, you know, contraband. Um, uh, we had parents bringing in drugs for their kids. Um, you know, just, just some really out of control behaviors, which for us in the addictions field, yeah, yeah, it makes sense. We get it. Yep, we, yep, get it. You know, that's why we do drug screens and do the things we do. But the hospital is just totally blown away. They don't understand it. So the training is important. The consultation, uh, being able to go in, we use motivational interviewing as our way of engaging with the patients, um, and then linkage to services outside the hospital setting. Um, it has been so successful that the hospital has developed what is called a behavioral health intervention team where they're not just looking at those that would meet potentially Marchman Act criteria, but uh, patients that um, also may meet Baker Act or other uh, mental health challenges to try to provide some triage. And it's a team that uh, is made up of access to psychiatric services, the um, nursing staff, um, the two, two ladies here, um, and um, case management as they look at exiting, exiting schedules. Um, and you know, when, when we look at what we're trying to accomplish, the idea is they're here and, and keep in mind that by the time they've reached this point, I kind of compare it to being at end stage cancer. You know, they have, they have they, this isn't just, oh, my first time I end up with a you know, bloodborne infection. No, that, that, it doesn't work that way. They have done so much damage to themselves prior to this that we are really looking at, we have, to, we have to, let's say, redirect our way of looking at success, okay? We measured, you know, unfortunately we have this pass-fail model in addictions where are you clean or not, you know? And, and I think we've missed the boat on that. And um, we need to be looking at are we able to extend the time that this person's able to maintain sobriety and recovery? Are we able to limit how many times this person comes back into the hospital because, yes, we've kept them engaged, 
And um, some of the other things that we're, we're looking at were in the early stages of uh, working with a hospital to potentially um, look at transitioning these patients um, partway through their treatment stay, you know, they're there six to eight weeks, possibly looking at week three and four and transitioning them to our residential center. The challenge we all have, and I think many of us are dealing with this, I think Meridian and uh, Shans have successfully navigated this, and then you may have as well, is um, how do you manage the medical complications within a rehab center and making sure you have that medical overlay that's adequate, and then how do you fund it? How do you make sure that you're able to pay for it? You know, because I'll be honest with you, some of the rates that we currently get would not, co would not cover um, the needs for the medical pieces. It's just, it wasn't built for that. We didn't you know, have that as a consideration, the medical complications. And most of these folks are indigent. You know, they don't have a funding source. They're coming in, they've burned every bridge, they don't have medical insurance, they're not gonna qualify for Medicaid. They can try to put them on some level of limited Medicaid, but it doesn't seem to transition with them. So, um, and as a point of note, we did a, we did a snapshot in 2000, October of 2016, looked at 10 patients within the hospital. Based on their costs, what the hospital looked at, those 10 patients incurred $2 million in costs, um, of which two of the 10 had a funding source to cover the, their, their care. Um, so it just, it speaks to, you know, some of the challenge we have. Also, um, we, are in the, we are in the early stages of implementing um, what we're calling SOS teams. Um, we were able to, through a foundation, Gulf Coast Community Foundation and our county government secure funding to implement a project to work with uh, those individuals who are overdosing, being identified by law enforcement and or EMS, coming in through the ER. And, in, and fortunately in Sarasota County, we have a county-funded addictions receiving facility that First Step operates. And um, the idea is, is that they come into the ER, um, they get transitioned. We now have access to the medica medication-assisted therapy, including working with PAR, because many of these patients, because of where they are, they're, they're, they, you know, whatever, again, whatever treatment modality works best, many of them go to PAR, many of them can come to us, meet with our, with our uh, Suboxone clinic um, and other things like that. But, you know, as, as, as we look at where we are, we're recognizing that the idea is if they're overdosing, let's try to prevent the second and third, because that's what we hear about. You know, when, when I'm talking to a law enforcement officer saying, I've been out to this home four times in the last five days for the same guy who's overdosed. Um, uh, the, in Manatee County, they had one patient, uh, one individual in a year's time who presented at the ED for overdoses 70 times. Um, um, and it's just, it's, I mean, these are the things we're looking at. But I do want to speak up for the patient population that we initially targeted, which is those with major medical crises. My fear is right now, and this, okay, I'm going to get political for a second. I've got eight seconds left. Um, we are seeing a drop in the overdose deaths, okay? Uh, we are in our community, Manatee and Sarasota County. Not a concurrent drop in child welfare removals. Not a concurrent drop in, in substance-exposed newborns. Um, you know, not, I mean, the, the, they, they have a code lavender at Sarasota Memorial Hospital when the, when the system is full. Well, they're in a code lavender right now, okay? I hope that we can make sure we do, relay the message that just because the overdose deaths currently appear to be going down, this isn't done. We're fixed. And I worry that we get lost and trapped into looking at um, the issue around, you know, the overdose deaths, one specific drug type, opiates, I mean, because cocaine is making a heyday. I mean, it's coming back. It's the second drug of leading cause of death in Sarasota County right now. Um, you know, we, we need to make sure we're capturing the entire gamut of those individuals with the disease of addiction who present with whatever drug of choice they may be have, utilizing currently and the other things that are going on complicating their lives. Okay, so just as a... I know you guys get it, but I'm speaking to the crowd. I got it. Thanks. Wow. I'll follow up on that. Well, I'm Patricia, and I'm at DACO, and I am one of the, I'm the clinician that actually goes out to St. Joseph through Baycare. So basically, I've had to go and educate the nurses, and go through the ER. I do a lot of stuff in the secure holding. I go up to the medical floor, and so 
I've had to go and talk to them, get them educated on what's going on, what kind of services we have. Because the biggest problem they have is when they have the clients come in to the ERs, as PJ was saying, you know, their potential overdose. They have to, they come in on a Marchman Act through law enforcement or it's a Marchman Act through the doctor to help get them in care. Or it become coming in as a mom bringing their son in and they don't know what to do, so they decide to go ahead and do a Baker Act. So they come in and they're seeking treatment. So they call me and I come in and either do it, come in to the assessment, I go into the hospital room, I go into the Skira holding, I sit and talk to them, talk to the doctor, what's going on, and try to link them to services. The biggest problem the hospitals are finding is they get these clients in there, they may get them stabilized, what do I do with them now? I need to find a placement. Where can I place them? What program can I do? What, what is the waiting list? And so that was the biggest dilemma. So that's how, I started getting into um, working with BayCare and working with St. Joseph's. The, everyone started talking, they started figuring out, we need to link the hospitals with the providers. And that's where DACO came in to linking those two together. So then I started working in with them and, and helping them and they're getting a lot of Marchman Acts through the court systems and so we help with this. We're getting a lot of um, Baker Acts and how do we deal with the, the mental health aspect of it? What do we do with trying to get them straight into residentials? So basically what my job is, I'm the soft hand transfer. I come in, I work with them, I'm trying to get them when they come into the hospital and they're starting to think, you know what, I need to have some treatment. So I go and I bridge straight from the hospital, straight to the treatment facility. And I said, I can help you walk you into this. I can get you through the process. I can help you through the assessment. Because once they're in the hospital, they're going, yes, I need help. But once they start getting a little okay and they're feeling good, that's when they're starting to say, you know what, I got this, I'm okay, I can, I can do this on my own, I'll do treatment later. And then, of course, what happens? A week later, three days later, they're right back in there. So that's why they call me, and I come in and I start talking to them. So you know what, you've been in here a couple times, as PJ says, you know, you've been coming through. So now, let's, let's see what's really going on. So that's when they transition. I got one lady, they called me in, she came into the hospital, they had her like three hours. They had her on a Baker Act. They called me in. I came in, did an assessment, got her off the Baker Act. Everything was good. They just, the doctor wanted a, a placement, and that's why they had her still on the Baker Act, basically. So I was able to get her into treatment right away, got her right into residential, and she's still doing well in residential right now. So it happened that fast. Within being on the street, getting into residential, it was probably eh, six hours, maybe. So that's the huge soft hand transition from the streets, from the ER into the treatment facility. Does it always happen that fast? No, unfortunately. You know, because we have to, as, as PJ was saying, there is the component of the medical. You know, I have to make sure they're medically stable. And that doesn't mean hospital medically stable, treatment medically stable. We, we're not a medical model. We, we don't treat severe medical. We can do that if, if they do it on an outpatient basis, where they're going to the hospitals and they're getting monitored that way, we can do that. And that was, I had another client, the same situation. I was getting them into residential. I even did the assessment in the medical floor. They brought me up, I went and did everything. He was all excited. But medically, we cannot have him. We could do outpatient, <coughs> we could do our MATS program, that's what we linked him up to, but we could not monitor some of the severity. So that's one of the biggest barriers. But we're still able to work with St. Joseph's hand in hand with this patient, can still do the monitoring medical there while we do the substance abuse, we do the mental health part of it at our facility. So it's working with the community and bridging all the pieces together within the community. And I think that's how we're going to conquer this epidemic, is really bridging everything together. We have law enforcement, you know, the clients go to court and involved with DCF and they're using, they continue using the Marchman Act. They're continuing using, they get in there, they end up having to go to the hospital to be a detox. 
they'll call us. We can try to get them into treatment quickly. It's just bridging everything together. So it's working with the law enforcement. It's working with the hospitals. It's working with the other providers. If I have a severe mental health that I can't deal with at my facility, I'm going to reach out to one of you guys that has a little more, that can focus more on the heavy severity of the mental health. Then once they get stabilized, then I can deal with the treatment and, and the substance abuse. So it's bridging all those gaps together, working together as a team, working together as a community. And I think that's the biggest piece here. Um, helping, getting these clients, getting these patients off the street, working with their addiction. You know, being able to go into the ER right away and assessing them. You know, being able to talk to the families and say, hey, maybe we need to Marchman Act. Maybe we need to do this, educating the families what Marchman Act is. I don't know about you, but I've had so many families that look at me, what is Marchman Act? And after I go, I can really do that? I'm like, yeah, you can do that. You can advocate. You can help your loved one get through this system very easily and get help for them. And so it's education on the medical side. It's education on the public side. And it's education with all of us, the clinicians as well, to working to bringing these clients and getting help for them. So that's kind of what we're doing and, and how we're working in the community and, and being on the grassroots of everything and working with the population and trying to be the ones that are out there and be the voice and, and work with these clients. All right. Here we go. So I think what we're talking about is bridging the gap. I think it's all about collaboration and a culture change, reaching out and meeting the patients where they are. No longer waiting for them to come to us, but actually going into the hospital systems where they're presenting in crisis. Sometimes it's um, medical conditions that are related to their substance use disorder or indirectly related to their substance use disorder. It's meeting them there, having the services available right there, working as a team with the hospitalist, with the nurses, educating, um, connecting services, connecting care. Um, making it a difference, reaching out and changing lives and saving lives and doing that as a community as a whole um, and, and get out of those siloed, um, I do this, you do that kind of thing. We're all in this together and I think that's where we're going to have the biggest impact is when we actually look at that, that we are actually here together to address this issue. We worked with our, our managing entity, Central Florida Behavioral Health Network, when we were designing the, the model um, to make sure that they were, and, and actually they fully endorsed what we were doing and were able to help us create the funding stream to put this in place. What we did at Sarasota Memorial Hospital, well actually let me, let me rephrase that, what Sarasota Memorial did so that we could address that issue, find a doctor sponsor within the hospital in the, with regard to credentialing in the hospital who sponsored our staff person. If we really want people who have lived experience to be able to work in some of these settings, we have to be able to get them through background screening first. And then the second thing is you've got to be able to get them in the, in, in, in the um, the location where you want the work to take place. We're having a hard time sometimes just getting them through the background screening part, even to make them available to go to the hospital and have the conversation. We'll be talking about that some this afternoon. Um, but um, Una and I were just talking, and this, all of this stuff that's taking place here, that can all be funded by STR. So I wanted Uda to just address that very quickly. Well, just like Mark said, <laughs> um, this is all part of the allowable service array. And if, you know, as we're learning more, and I mean, this is all new, right? This is this big chunk of money came in. It wasn't going to be allocated perfectly from the first minute on. So for these type of things, I mean, this is exactly what STR is supposed to do. That's there's how outreach, ours there's intervention. That's exactly how ours is funded. Yeah, you're doing it through STR? Yeah. So this is, these are perfect examples. <laughs> Using that Bridger model, I mean, we have actually carved out um, funds in the grant to pilot these type of emergency room, but that doesn't mean we can't do more with the big pot of funds. I mean, you can do outreach, you can do intervention, you can do case management. You, you know, these are the kind of things that, innovative type of things that we want to see with STR. 
um, and the bridging is a is is a huge piece. And I love the fact that you guys are doing that induction right in the ER, so you're you're kind of taking out that you know risk of of of, of having withdrawal and getting people into uh, ongoing MAT. So these are these are exactly the things that we we'd love to see more of with with the STR funds. They added in let in uh, Mary. Let me get to you a second. They added. In Senate Bill 8 this week, um, they added in language that basically says health plans. <coughs> I wish I had the language in front of me, but it basically says health plans um, can't require uh, can't require step therapy and other things. That that if medication assisted treatment is appropriate, you have access to medication assisted treatment. That's essentially a summary of what got added into that legislation because that's been part of the problem. People say, well, you have to go do this first. You have to go Something else we're working on is Medicaid. Medicaid says you come in for an assessment, then the next day you can get a service. Well, um, you can't send somebody that has an opioid addiction away and say, come back in tomorrow for your first dose of Suboxone. They won't show up. So we, we think we're, gonna, we're getting that clarified. So there's some structural issues around that that uh, we want to hear about, and we want to try to make every effort we can to fix some of those structural issues that get in the way uh, of this happening. Completely off uh, Subutex is the answer to that question. There are a subset that do require to be on sub Subutex for the duration. Uh, our program, uh, our premise is that we have been able to take them off completely. Obviously, with all the components of the program, which is stable housing, continued treatment, engagement, um, there's many components of the program which allow us to do this. So, so typically, it's not the standard of care and, and when you read some of the standards out there, uh, but we've had very high success rates with even the follow-up being moms that continue afterwards a uh, high percentage of them are staying off and, and are not going back or needing to be placed back on Suboxone or Subutex. We do have the subset now because of MAT and, and STR. There have been some moms that have needed that and even access to even Vivitrol. So, so there are a lot of opportunities, um, but to answer that initial question, uh, yes. What trimester do you do that? What trimester, excuse me? Do you take them off? What so the, typically the trimester, it, it depends. Every, everybody's different and it's between the physician, uh, the OB, but it ranges, it, it, it typically ranges. It, it really depends on when the patient was initiated, how well they're doing. Um, we monitor a variety of things, so we're looking at not only how the baby's responding, we do BPPs, which is a biophysical profile, it's really to assess how well the baby's responding or withdrawing. A lot of programs that initiate, even when we're talking about methadone, the monitoring that goes on is not as comprehensive as what we've incorporated into our program. So we would like to, we will, we believe that what we're doing is meeting the demands of what's recommended, but also ensuring that the baby is not actually withdrawing and having any complications from this. I'm, I'm going to add that the way our program was designed initially, and it was working very closely with our managing entity, was to um, be able to do inductions on pregnant women on Subutex coming in through the emergency department. So the concept of the ER started very early for us because when a pregnant woman who is um, has a substance use disorder is looking for care, she wants to come in right away, right? I mean, I think uh, we all know that all of our, our clients would like to come in right away, but in this case, we wanted them to have 24 24-7, 365 access to care. So we started working with our emergency department staff at that point to be able to get women, identify them, and then get them into treatment. We partner with a uh, local residential program for pregnant for women with children and women who are pregnant. So the goal is that once we do the induction on, on Subutex and then working to get them off, they go immediately into a controlled setting. So they're not in the community um, without being on medication. And um, what Dr. Oxen was referring to is that after they have the baby um, and then they come to us, some of them are reinitiating that um, either by getting on Vivitrol um, through our program or coming into our, um, our program, which uses Suboxone. Um, and also, as far as the HCA issue, there's a House bill, I think it's 429, that addresses the need to um, emergency departments use best practices and have a, a program in place in order to reduce the number of opioid-related deaths. Okay. 
Fatter just got a uh, Edna Foundation grant that is going to uh, be working in the to help create bridges between um, hospitals and providers. Um, one of the things, one of the very first things that's going to happen is, is documenting all these incredible op uh, opportunities that are taking place. So one of the first tools that you all will have will be, will be a compendium of look, look what's happening in other hospitals across the state. Um, uh, why, why can't we? Um, so I think, I think that'll be something. And then there's all, we're working with the Florida Hospital Association and the, um, the Florida Association of Emergency Room Physicians on that project. So I think there'll be some conversation and some doors open that will allow maybe some, some different shifting about um, the hospital looking at the role. Uh, one of the things we do know is probably the most significant thing we know is this is costing hospitals a lot of money. In 2015, the Palm Beach Post got ACA data, and they looked at the first nine months of the year of 2015, and they did five codes, five codes, and five codes cost $1.1 billion. So we know this is costing a lot of money. So we think there's a good value proposition and a return on investment for the hospitals to engage differently in this process uh, exactly uh, what PJ was saying. Sarasota Memorial is now saying, wow. And I know PJ told me one day that, you know, uh, they're asking him to come in and, and, and do in service with, with, the, with the rounds so that, so everybody starts to understand more about, whoa, the role of these patients in here and, and, and some options we have with those patients to effectively intervene with them. Because I don't think there's a medical professional that wants to serve and go. They want to serve and have the person move to a, a healthy, a healthy lifestyle. So, so that's part of the the end goal here. I think that everybody's uh, trying to get to. One of the things I want us to take away from this as well is the consideration of this is integrated healthcare. Um, we are not behavioral health and then medical care over here. Um, we, we I've, I've, I, I hope that we as a takeaway that you walk away from here that we. We have a skill set that the medical community could benefit from for treating all chronic illnesses that are with patients that don't mind. You know, we have the ability to work with that population and that we really need to consider ourselves an integrated part of that medical continuum. Okay, yes, we are a specialty, um, uh, Mary Lynn, and, and I do agree with that, but they're all still part of that same family. And right now, we are a specialty that it's an outlier. And I'd like to see us move in that direction where we are, we are integrated. So I've been asked, wow, could we, um, could we do something with all, all the uh, clinicians in a certain community? The answer is yes. We could set up a training for all the clinicians in a certain community. Then I got asked, well, if we had a doctor do that, could that doctor also stay and meet with some of our medical professionals? And, and the answer is yes. Uh, and uh, you all could pay lunch, the doctors would come. Um, you, could, you could then um, uh, give them a CME or two and everybody would be thrilled and you'd have some education that didn't take place. Um, I had a conversation about my, my hospital is being very, very resistant. So the answer is yes, we can get somebody to sit and, and engage in a conversation with your hospital folk about some of these options. So those resources are available to you and we're hopefully gonna end up today again trying to see what we can do. I know that the department is committed to put as much flexibility as they possibly can with the resources we have to try to help you all do this work the way this work needs to get done. So I, I've not been in a situation where you've got as much commitment to do it, and it just now is, is you, you gotta think outside the box, you gotta go to your ME and negotiate outside the box, and then you gotta start practicing outside the box um, in order to make this happen. And then the same question over here, can we have somebody come in and talk to your clinicians? Yes, um, because we do have to make the cultural shift.